From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Dr. Edward Wilson, Mr. Dollar. Oh, hello, doctor. Mr. Comstock of Tri-Mutual Insurance asked me to call you. Regarding the death of Thomas Rene Lamar. Yes. I've just left the police department. The chief autopsy surgeon... Yes? There's no question about it. Thomas Lamar was poisoned. I... I see. I'd like to talk to you, Doctor. I understand you were one of Mr. Lamar's closest friends. Yes. And one of the beneficiaries of his will. That's quite... Where did you learn that? I didn't. It was a shot in the dark. No, look here, young... Better stick close to your office, Doctor. I'm on my way over to see you. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Home Office, Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Lamar matter, now proven to be murder. As the facts of this case lined up, it appeared that Thomas Rene Lamar, wealthy manufacturer of aircraft components, had only two really good friends. Lawrence Comstock, who had issued him a million and a half worth of life insurance policies, and Dr. Edward T. Wilson, and a wonderful, lovely, charming adopted daughter, Laban whom I'd met during my brief vacation in La Jolla, California, whom I'd accompanied back here to South Bend, Indiana, when she received word of her father's sudden death. What little evidence I'd been able to pick up seemed to point to one Walter Marson, Lamar's personal secretary. Unknown to Lamar, he had married Bonnie, and therefore stood to benefit from his death. Oh, why kid about it? I'd fallen for the girl, heavily. And when I found out that she was already married to a slick, smart promoter... Well, let's keep personalities out of this case, especially mine. I'd told Vonnie that I'd come up and see her out at the family mansion, but I thought I'd better contact Dr. Wilson first. Come in. Come in, Mr. Dollar. I've heard a great deal about you from Lawrence Comstock. And please, sit down. Thanks, Doctor. You said something over the phone that's bothered me. I won't mince words. Apparently, you and Larry Comstock were Thomas Lamar's closest friend. I don't think there's any question about it, my boy. And I'm sure Lawrence will verify that. He already has. That's why I took a shot in the dark and suggested that you're a beneficiary of Lamar's will. Not his insurance. I already know that his daughter, Vonnie, gets that, but his will. Well, does that shock you? I suppose Larry's a beneficiary, too. Yes. Then either one of you might conceivably have had a motive for bringing about his death. What? Now, just a minute, you're Relax, doctor, relax. I make no bones about it. This is the roughest case I ever tried to handle. Unfortunately, I started out by getting myself emotionally involved with Bonnie Lamar. Go ahead, laugh if you want to. Hardly. She's a very wonderful girl. A bit mixed up at times, perhaps, because of... Well, because of what? Are you aware that unknown to her father, Bonnie was married... Is married? Yes, to some Walter Marson, Larry Comstock told me. Marson was Thomas Lamar's personal secretary. Did Lawrence tell you why she married him? I don't think he knows. It was a few short months after Thomas Lamar's wife died. A terrible blow both to Vani, who was completely devoted to her foster mother, and to him. By way of quenching his sorrow, Thomas drove himself in his work, 16, 18 hours a day at the plant, all his waking hours, so that he would have time to think of nothing but his work. But Vonnie had no such outlet for her emotions. Her friends, a lot of rich 'er ne'er-do-wells, rich, worthless bums, if you like, got her interested in gambling. She plunged into it with a recklessness and abandon that quickly got her into debt so deeply that there was only one way out. Her father didn't know? No, no, no. But young Marson did, and he took full advantage of it. In return for her agreement to marry him... He promised to quietly obtain the necessary funds from Thomas Lamar's investments, which he, Marson, handled. And he did. And she married him. Yes. But how could she? She didn't love him. You must realize her emotional state at that time. 
She was terribly upset over the recent death of her mother, and so was her father, of course. She knew the shock it would be if he ever knew of her gambling and the tremendous debt she'd incurred. She was beside herself, ready to do anything. So she married Marson. I could kill him. Now, let's get one thing straight, Mr. Dollar. Yes? You, too, were a bit upset when you came in here. You spoke as though you might think both Lawrence Comstock and I could have motive for wanting Thomas's death. I'm sorry, Doctor. I... It's true that we are beneficiaries of his will, at least Thomas assured us we were, but only in a very minor way. Thomas was loyal to us as he was to the servants who have been so devoted to him for so long, and whatever little he has left us and them... I'm sorry, Doctor. I... Oh, I, I guess I was just feeling hurt and angry and taking it out on anyone I could find. At least that's the way Larry Comstock put it. And he was right. Now I got a job to do. What did the police found out? Only enough to back up my immediate suspicion that Thomas was poisoned by pyridamron. Pyridamron? Yes, it's a little-known drug that produces tremendous but only momentary stimulation to the heart, causes the heart to almost literally burst, and it leaves virtually no traceable residue in the system. But you said the chief autopsy surgeon found out... Oh, no, no. He found only positive indication that pyridamron had been used. I found the first clue to it only minutes after Thomas died. A staining of the tongue that even then was rapidly disappearing. Can you tie this drug in with Walter Marson? No. No, the fact that it was available at all has stumped both the police and myself. The last known source was a small island off the coast of Greece many, many years ago... And all the tiny plants from which it could be obtained as pollen were burned by the Greek government. But somebody, somewhere, must have had some seeds, planted them, and obtained this pollen. Yes. How do you suppose Mr. Lamar took the stuff? Well, it could have been mixed with one of the medicines in the cabinet in his bathroom, but we found no traces. Uh-huh. Larry Comstock said you used to give him harmless sugar pills as a kind of sedative. Yes. Thomas knew they were perfectly harmless, but he occasionally took them anyway. <laughs> it was a kind of joke. Could this uh, pirate stuff have been mixed with him? We found no trace in the bottle. But you would have been able to. Yes. It is only an assimilation by the human body that dissipation is so complete as to make it virtually undetectable. Uh -huh. I'm afraid I haven't been of much help to you, Mr. Dollar. I think you have, Doctor. I think you have. It was only a hunch. But in this business, you sometimes have to depend as much on hunches as on common sense. I picked out the library nearest to the Lamar residence to do my research. Pirate Dameron. You're sure that is the word? Yes. Can't you find anything on the subject? Nothing beyond what you found in the Pharmacopoeia Index. The name of the plant from which it is derived. Blepharra purpurus calandus. No common name. Yeah, no... Well, thanks. Of course, the main branch of the city library in Chicago might have something. Sure, thanks. Why, uh, yes, yes, I'm sure I can find what you're looking for. You see, I myself am quite a student of rare drugs and poisons. Oh, what's that? Well, after a long, dull day here at the library, I enjoy nothing more than curling up in a big chair in my little apartment and reading detective fiction. Oh, well, uh, where's the book? I'll show you. Uh, but quietly, please. We must maintain the proper atmosphere for our readers. Oh, sure. Yes, I know the poison pyridamron very well. It was used in that wonderful story, The Case of the Yellow-Lipped Monster. Oh, excellent book. Thrilling. Oh, you should read it. Yeah, well... Uh... Pyridamron was new to me, so as usual, I had to find out all about it, and I did find out, too. The plant it's derived from, where it's grown, uh, where it was grown. You see, it's been extinct now for many years. Yeah, I understand. Oh, now... Deadly thing, terribly deadly. But now here is the book that will tell you all about it. The title is Flora Exotica Mediterranea. That means exotic flowers of the Mediterranean. Uh, hmm, Flora Exotica Mediterranea. Hmm. What's the matter? I don't... Oh, good heavens, it isn't here. Are you sure? But it was. I'm sure it was only yesterday. Oh, dear. Well, here, do you see? It was taken out from right here. Well, who took it out? I don't know. Won't your records show? No, I never permit any books to be taken from this section without my knowledge. Oh, never. Afraid somebody'd consult the stuff for ulterior motives? Oh, oh, dear, no. It's just that the only ones who want these books are the rabid whodunit fans like myself, and, uh, well, I like to talk to them. Well, isn't there some other book that might give me the information I want? Oh, not another book in the world. I know. And now, oh, tragedy, it's been stolen. <laughs> Well, this was one time a hunch didn't pay off. Quite the contrary. I'd wasted a lot of time. 
Expense account item 9, 520. Taxi out to the Lamar mansion. I was almost relieved to learn that Vonnie was not home. I'm very sorry, sir, but she and Mr. Marson left shortly after noon to make the funeral arrangements. Thank you, Harrison. However, as you know, Miss Vonnie wished you to have full access to the house, and if you care to wait... How is she holding up, Harrison? Most admirably, Mr. Dollar, under the circumstances. Uh, Mr. Lamar's passing has been a terrible thing for her, for all of us. Yes, sure, of course. What will happen to the house, I don't know. Won't Miss Lamar continue to live in it? This morning she said no, that she'd travel for a while and then settle down somewhere else far away from the city. Oh? And what about you, the servants? Oh, we shall, of course, have to seek employment elsewhere. Say, tell me, Harrison, didn't Mr. Lamar provide for you in his will? I do not know, sir, and I do not particularly care. His kindness and loyalty to us during his lifetime was far more important than any provision he may have made for us. Well, I... I guess that takes you off the list. Uh, beg pardon? Nothing. Say, so tell me, has Walter Marson been around much since Mr. Lamar's death? Yes, he's been most attentive to Miss Lamar, which we've all appreciated. He lives here in the house, you know. No, I didn't know. Harrison, I'd like to see his room. Sir? I'm going to lay my cards right on the table. I'm an insurance investigator. Here, my card. Why, I... Oh, I see. Miss Vonnie hadn't so informed me. Because she didn't know. Well, sir, I... Now show me to Marson's room. Uh, yes, yes, sir. Uh, this way, please. Do you like Walter Marson? Yes, sir, very much. Now. What does that mean? I've never spoken of this to anyone else, Mr. Dollar. For years, Walter Marson was a clever, scheming, conniving young man with overpowering ambition to take over the Lamar Corporation. So I've heard. I'm convinced that at one time he even tried to marry Miss Lamar and solely for the purpose of forcing his way into the business. Just trying to... Well, yes, sir. However, in the past year or two, Mr. Marson has changed completely. What makes you think so? Because of conversations between him and Mr. Lamar that I could not avoid overhearing from time to time. Mr. Lamar knew what Marson was attempting and faced him with his knowledge of it. Uh, here is his room. Go on. Uh, Mr. Lamar could have made it very difficult for him in view of his record. Prison record? Uh, yes, sir, for embezzlement. But instead, he gave the young man another chance. So? Go on. And Mr. Marson made the most of it. He changed completely. I say without reservation, sir, that Mr. Marson is as honorable a young man as I know. Pretty sure of that, aren't you? Yes, sir. A butler living as close to them for both for so long can invariably... Invari Pardon me, sir, but does something give you the reason to think I'm mistaken? No, no. Unless perhaps it's this book I just found lying on his desk. Book, sir. Flora Exotica Mediterranea. <laughs> Here's our star to tell you about the final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the wind-up, and a switch that will make your head spin. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs> 